Adam Miller, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. So, okay, my first question is, I know you're in Italy, but Adam Miller mm -hmm. doesn't sound like an Italian name. No, it's not. I'm from the States. I grew up in Oregon. Oh, okay. Um, there until I was 16, then I came to Italy for about a year and a half, two years, went back and spent the rest of my life in uh, the United States. And I've just been back for about two years now. So what brought you to Italy at 16? Did your parents go there? Well, no, I was studying art at that point already. I was, I began my career, we could say very loosely, wanting to be a comic book artist mm -hmm. and start studying around 12. You can't and be serious. When I, 12. 12, yeah, very early. And then I went to art school in Italy when I was to the Florence Academy first when I was 16. I didn't last long. Um, I think I was a bit immature for the curriculum at that point. And then I switched yeah, to another school. Yeah, that's pretty young. Yeah. And it was a whole different kind of teaching. You know, I, I didn't experience, I hadn't experienced anything like that before. At which point I switched to the Angel Academy and continued to study for a bit here. But Florence has always just been a place that I've been, you know, surrounding my life. So why was Angel Academy a better fit? Well, you know, when I went to visit his school, uh, he had some paintings in progress that were multi-figure paintings. I think he had a big risen Christ, which I found really intriguing. Mm -hmm. You know, this is kind of thing that I've always wanted to do. So I went, ah, okay, this guy's going down the same avenue in, with his art that I would love to do. And by the way, I saw your crucifixion painting. That was beautiful. Oh, that was thank fantastic. you. I really appreciate it. So this that. whole idea of narrative paintings, of storytelling yeah. was something saw there that pulled me in. And then, you know, I spent years and years after this just making terrible paintings and trying to mature as an artist, but that was the beginning. Wow. So how did you manage to, first of all, start studying at 12? Because most of us are just what, a 12 year old, you're like in the seventh grade, eighth grade. I mean, how, how did yeah, you pull their parents pull that. you out of school? No, no, I went after school. Up until I was about 14, I was taking classes, learning perspective, you know, some of these basic things that as a comic artist you would need to know. And then when I was about 14, I just stopped going to school and got very into classical art, started reading John Ruskin, going out and sketching in the, in the hills. Like, I really got into the whole Victorian kind of uh, pre-Raphaelite thing, which was a bit weird for a 14-year-old. Well, there's a but lot of that's I, weird about this story. Before you go to, I got too many questions. <laughs> what about your parents? They were okay with you at 14 years old, just dropping out of school? Ah, they didn't know. I didn't tell them. You're, so are you about, serious? Yeah, yeah. It took about six months for them to find out. Wow. That, that is wild. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a bit late at that point. You know, the, you couldn't really comfortably go back. That six months was gone. And so I remember my father saying at one point, he's like, okay, if you want to do this, you can do it. But the one thing you have to do is you have to be good. You know, so you can't be terrible. Uh, okay. Yeah, you're blowing my mind. I've never heard anything like this. I've, are other people as surprised as me when they hear this story? Have you told this very you often? You know, I've told it a lot. Yeah, I think it's give or take. I think the people that know me kind of recognize and go, okay, that makes sense. That sounds this like is, your personality. <laughs> sounds like the kind of way you make decisions. <laughs> it's a bit Holy cow. erratic and emotional. But what about, I mean, your parents, weren't they freaking out that their 14 year old just drops out of school without telling them? Aren't they like in total panic mode? Wondering uh, what you're going to do with your uh, life? You know, I was surprised how well they took it actually. I think they, um, I think my father particularly was very resigned to the fact that this is what was going to happen. And he had a background in acting. So I think he understood that you could go for the arts, that it was possible. Mm. And I think that was his approach of saying, okay, you've come this far, you're serious, you seem serious. And, and then it went against the advice of other family friends and people who also had a background in the arts who said, wait a minute, he wants to be a classical painter too. Now this <laughs> Oh is no. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. 
Wow. So I have to give my father a huge amount of credit on that. I mean, I think he, I think he knew I was a bit stubborn too. And he said, this is, it's either this or who knows what. What about your mom? Where did she stand on the whole thing? Mm, I think she was a little less intrigued by the idea. I think she was a bit more nervous that this was a giant mistake. And, but she came around, you know, my father, the, after realizing I wasn't going to school, hired a teacher who was teaching at the school that was teaching comics. And he had a whole interesting background too. He had been in jail for a while and really learned to draw while he was in jail. I believe for robbing banks. I think this was what was going on. The story just and keeps getting better. <laughs> it's a strange story, stranger and stranger too. But after a time, he was having some trouble, mm -hmm. but he was given a chance to teach at this school. Um, and so my father said, okay, I'll rent you this little studio, which was very cheap back in you know the mid nineties. And you can work there, just teach my son a little bit. And my memory gets a little gray, but I'm pretty sure that was the arrangement that happened. So he taught me for a while. He gave me the sort of the basics. He trained me a bit, you know, with a very sort of gruff, but grounded approach to drawing where he would, you know, see, get the lines in quickly, get the gesture, stop being so, you know, I had been very anal retentive in my drawing up to that point, looking at reading John Ruskin and looking at the pre-Raphaelites. And his famous quote to me, I remember, was, you know, you drew that, it's okay, but a real man would get the lines in in about 30 seconds and build on those. So I was trying to learn to draw, you know, like a real man. And uh, and that got me, you know, it, it helped. It definitely helped. And then from there, I made a little portfolio and got accepted to the Florence Academy of Art. Wow. Yeah, that is mind-blowing. And then your parents sent you across the world at 16 that yeah that yep. is incredible what did they think of you at florence academy where or was that common to have a 16 year old show up you know i think a few people were intrigued but i don't think i distinguished myself when i was there <laughs> you know i think yeah. by the time i had gotten there i had moved in i had been a little bit wild you know and i had gone and I was hanging out in a warehouse in Portland with a bunch of painters who were all modern painters doing murals, things like this. And so my ideas had changed a little bit in the interim, because of course you're accepted to school and there's a good six month lag between the time that you go from the time they accepted you. So in that six months, I had gotten more and more sort of, let's say conceptual and narrative in my work and a bit less traditional copying what I was seeing in front of me. So by the time I showed up to the Florence Academy, my head was in a little bit of a different spot. And I think going back to do bar drawings was a bit outside of my, I'd say maturity level and comfort range at the same time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're seriously blowing my mind. Okay. So then, so at 16, you didn't think you were mature enough or you didn't feel mature enough. So you came back to Oregon. Is that correct? When I was about 18, I, uh, I left, I came back and, um, so you did last two years at Florence. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. I lasted a year and a half, but most of it at Michael John angel and a little bit of the, Oh, Florence. so you made that. Okay. So I misunderstood. You made that switch on your first Very trip back or your first, um, time in Italy. That's when you made the switch to angel. Yeah. Yeah. It was okay. one semester and I switched over. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, and made it a little bit. I think I finished the cast drawing section and then I was off to teach myself, you know, like a very naive person thinking I'm going to go out into the world. I'm sure there's some king or pope who needs a painting. And, you know, just like in the old days. And instead I ended up, you know, traveling around a bit, going from cheap rent to cheap rent, continuing to study, continuing to try to develop my skills trying to figure out, you know, what was this thing that these Renaissance painters were doing that I'm so intrigued by. And gradually, you know, over the course of many years, ended up when I was in my mid twenties in New York and started to study again, because I realized I didn't quite have what I wanted from the earlier days. 
kind of went through a second period where I was painting and studied with Nelson Shanks a little bit. Um, watched that Studio in Caminati? No, at the Art Students League. Oh, okay. Was this this yeah. prior to in Studio in Caminati then? No, I think Studio in Caminati was running in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Somewhere around Philadelphia, but I was in New York, so I was okay. taking class at the Art Students League. You know, it was um, cheap fun available i had just gotten out of a very long relationship so i landed in new york and thought you know a young person in new york i was enjoying life let's say yeah and enjoy students league meeting painters meeting all kinds of people okay so just to give me a little more perspective when what year were you born ah 79 79 okay so this was quite a while ago this all happened yeah, yeah. This was a while back. This was, I mean, mid-90s studying in Italy and then up to mid-2000s, kind of trying to take my work to another level mm -hmm. in New York. And really all of it guided by this idea of I want to learn how to do this multi-figure sort of narrative painting thing that I don't really see people doing. So it was mm -hmm. a bit of a process to kind of develop what does that mean? You know, I'll take a little bit from here. I'll take a little bit from there and try to piece something together. Okay. So at 12, you want to do comic book art mm -hmm. by 16. You knew you wanted to do multi-figure painting, I assume. Yeah. Okay. And has it ever changed? Have you ever <clears throat> took it, taken any tangents or any change of direction at all? Mm, not really. I wouldn't say a change of direction other than little side projects of developing down one area or another that was related to it, but not exactly the same. You know, I'd say it went on to the back burner at various times when I was doing simpler paintings. Because when I was younger, pretty much what I knew how to do were simpler paintings. You know, I'd try my hand at these big epic things, but I wasn't really mentally prepared to to kind of comprehend the amount of work and design and composition <laughs> that went into making these paintings. You know, I thought I would just set something up and paint it and get a little sketchy, like you were painting the model in life drawing class. Mm -hmm. And somehow this worked out. And it wasn't until I started, I'd say I met some painters in New York who Martin Whitfoot, Brad Kunkel, um, Nicola Verlato, um, Chris Pugliese, I met some of these guys who I was watching them work and I went, ah, okay, there's really a smarter, better way to do this. That's, let's say, a little less just counting on your own macho-ness to say, I'm good enough to just go in here, you know, guns blazing like a cowboy. And I realized this art of composition was something very specific and required much more work and thought and time than the actual painting. Hmm. I want to come back to that uh, because I re because composition really interests me. As you know, I'm also a multi-figure painter, and I feel like yeah. it's been a long, <laughs> slow road figuring out that composition is the most important thing for me. You you seem to have figured this out. Really, you seem to have figured out a lot of things really early in life. Where I'm still, I'm just <laughs> coming to that realization of how important composition is, particularly in a multi-figure painting. Um, but I got a couple more questions about your childhood and youth because it's just so fascinating. First of all, you grew up in Oregon. And my understanding is, I've never been to Oregon, but my understanding is the Northwest is so, you know, it's just not a place where you see a lot of realism. I mean, it's very modern no. up there. And so... What do you attribute this longevity of your goals in an environment that is totally opposed to those goals? Hmm. I would say, I'd say it's, it's, how would you describe it? It might be something almost a bit spiritual, right? Um, in a way that's hard to articulate, but I think when I saw and really saw, like deeply saw and experienced is of Raphael, images of Michelangelo, uh, the Sistine ceiling. I heard certain musical pieces 
I would say what some that really hit me in the beginning were from Mozart, the Requiem, Wagner's The Ring Cycle. And there was something I felt in this work that seemed more significant mm -hmm. and more important than the stuff that was around me. And I think I was just very stubborn. So even though everybody said, this is wrong, why would you do this? Nobody does this. And I think it was even worse in the 90s. Uh, if you were somewhere like the Northwest, it just didn't exist. People thought, people who are friends of the family who knew about more about the arts, let's say, thought it was just bizarre that mm -hmm. anybody would even, it was something worth doing. But I believe that, you know, they say either what's more likely, you are wrong or everybody else is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I assumed everybody else was wrong or had accommodated their thinking to um how would you say i think there's two things that are key here when you think about art and what people choose to do because you can approach art from an aesthetic point of view or a spiritual point of view which i think are very closely connected i think aesthetics basically comes out of spirituality and we've sort of isolated it as a concept and tried to separate it but it's really not separable and i think there's um tribal status considerations right and so both of these things are there in the way people experience art, just like with music. There's a tribal belonging kind of category that comes into music as well. You dress this way, you listen to this kind of music, these things tend to add up. Um, and it's a question of which one's more important to you. So I think really interesting artists tend to have the aesthetic spiritual side dominant over the tribal status side. But most people are not like this because as a human, Tribal belonging and status is far more important to your daily life than aesthetics to most, most people most of the time. You know? You're not going to be thrown out into the forest to starve to death because your aesthetic sense is off. Mm -hmm. But you definitely will if you end up with a low enough status in the tribal group. You know? So I think this is just kind of deep human stuff that when you think about it, I wasn't thinking this way at 15 or 16. But I think I was intuiting it that there was something a bit wrong with all of these people having exactly the same opinion. And I looked at art over 30,000 years, let's say, and I went, here's all the possibilities. And everybody's stuck on this idea that it has to be done the same way. And this is what they would tell me. I went to uh, the Pacific Northwest College of Art to, um, to apply when I was 16. And they said, of course, yeah, but here's what you're going to have to do you're going to have to put aside this painting stuff of like this realist stuff, excuse me. And you're going to have to learn to paint abstractly. I don't know, wait a minute. This is not going to work for me. This is a waste of my time. Same at the Chicago Art Institute. Um, and there's a couple others that I applied to that had the same attitude. And I just thought, okay, these guys are missing something. I think they're missing it. And I just, then I intuited it. Their relation to art was not as deep and spiritual and powerful as what I sensed when I was reading about the Renaissance, when I was looking at Raphael, Da Vinci, and seeing their paintings and looking at Michelangelo's statues. And I was going, this is a much deeper, deeper connection to the work of art than I'm witnessing, you know, going to openings in Oregon or talking to college professors. They just didn't have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you got me thinking about how quickly trends in art changed in the 20th century. It's like, how many movements did we have in just 100 years? And quite a few. Yeah, a lot. And so, and I mean, as far as I know, that was probably the fastest moving century in the arts as far as the different movements. But everyone just followed like sheep. You know, the movement yeah. went and the artists went with it. And which, and I'd never thought about it the way you just verbalized it in that, that there was this tribal mentality where mm -hmm. everyone just wants to be accepted. Everyone just wants to be part of the crowd at the expense of beauty, at the expense of quality, at the expense of craftsmanship. That had never, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, you and I share many of the same sensibilities, but that had never occurred to me before. Not, not the way you put it. Well, it's an interesting thing, right? And you, if you factor in rising levels of wealth in the 20th century, yeah. well, you have 
lot of people who have now the free time to sit around and speculate about what role art should play, which wasn't really the case before. You know, I think in the past, it was clear what role art would play. It was there connected to religion. After religion, it was connected to the aristocracy. It celebrated certain ideals. And those ideals themselves limited the art, right? And I mean limited in a fairly healthy sense. Because if you're trying to form spiritual, emotional connection to people, there's only certain ways you can go about doing that. If you have a lot of people sitting around thinking in the abstract about, no, art should do this, no, art should do that, and it becomes an intellectual exercise, suddenly every lost those containing boundaries. And so, of course, you can change it. The thing that's interesting that you brought up is the fact that it all changed at the same time, right? Everybody went left at the same time or went right at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's also connected to the ability of governments to manipulate things, right? You get into the 1950s, post-war, you have the Cold War, you have art suddenly becoming a symbol of American freedom in contrast to Russian repression. And so there's going to be a certain kind of art that's promoted and was promoted heavily with a lot of money behind it. And so art really becomes a political thing, which it always was in a sense, but it was, I think, symbolic in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at a crucifix by uh, Rubens, it's symbolic of a story embedded in the painting. If you look at a abstract painting, I'd say from the 1960s, oftentimes it's promoted as something that's symbolic of a political agenda and even if the artist isn't on board with that, there's a reason that piece was picked. And there's a reason everybody goes left at the same time, I think. And it's because that's where the money is, right? That's where the impetus is. That's where the energy is. And it's not an accident. It's because I think the Cold War shaped the entire structure of the 20th century culturally in ways that we just take for granted. But if you back out and put yourself in the eyes of somebody from 400 years ago, they would look at all of that and go, this is so strange. Look how people dress. Look at the music they're listening to. I mean, somebody from the 19th century would just, their mind would be blown. They go, these people have lost it completely. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen this video, but there was this art historian. And everyone, the, the listeners are going to have to forgive me, but if they've listened to the podcast, they know my memory sucks. But this art historian goes into this collector's home and this guy's real sassy. He just says what he thinks. He's not filtered at all. Goes into this collector's home. This guy's obviously a millionaire or a billionaire. He's got a red canvas on the wall that says, that's written on why the chicken crossed the road. Mm. And the, um, the art historian challenged him on it and said, why did you, and he paid 600 grand for it, if I remember correctly, 600 grand for a word written on a canvas or a sentence written on a canvas. And uh, the guy challenged it, our historian challenged him and he said, what, why is that significant? Why is that worth buying and hanging in your house? And he started going on about the quote unquote human condition that we often hear, you know, that total cliche phrase that we hear all the time. And it was just, it was, I think he really believed it. You know, I, I think he yeah. genuinely believed it. And oh. I just think about what you're saying about this tribal nature. It's like he was told that was, that was art. He was told that that was meaningful and he was willing to believe it right, you know, down to 600 grand. Well, and that's the interesting thing, right? Is that again, coming back to like psychology, how does it work? We have these two the idea of the two sides of the brain, right? Interpreted loosely. The one leading is not the intellect. The one leading is the emotion, the desire. Yeah. So if you want to believe something, it's incredible how quickly you can start to believe it, right? You can say to yourself, I'm not going to eat bread for a week. And immediately your mind kicks in and it says, yeah, but you know, bread is actually really good for you. People have eaten bread for thousands of years. It's probably in your genetics by now. It's just something that you probably need. Look at those teeth you have that are good for grinding. You immediately start to rationalize your desires, right? So I think that's always an interesting thing when we think about how we relate to art is to say, 
It's not whether we like something or not. Again, that's too general, right? That's because like is a very general statement. We can be attracted or something can appeal to us for reasons of status, for reasons of aesthetics, for reasons of spirituality, for reasons that it's simply a good investment. And then we find a way to talk ourselves into accepting that we think it's great because we don't want to see ourselves as a person who just has no taste and buys things as an investment, right? We'd rather see ourselves as a witty, brilliant connoisseur who also makes investments. So we'll, we'll rationalize that choice. So I think that's, he probably did believe it. I think we mostly believe things that we want to believe. Yeah. For, and and I kind of wonder too, if collectors like this enjoy feeling like they're in uh, on the know and that the rest of us are clueless. And if it's completely yeah. non-objective, like this painting, and the rest of us just say things like, like I've seen, I've heard so many of my friends say, so many people who are not artists say, I just don't understand art. Then the elite are like, yeah, those little people don't understand art. When the reality is they do. It's the elite that yeah. don't, <laughs> not all the elite well, of course, great. but it's wild. I kind of wonder if, the, if there's, there's just some joy in, uh, and feeling like you're the only one in on the joke. I think there is, and I think it's also a genuine, a genuine situation, right? Yeah. Because again, if you get back to the 17th century, the purpose of art was very clear. You had church paintings. Mm -hmm. The purpose was incredibly clear. Everybody understood what they were. You had civic art. Everybody understood that to celebrate historical heroes, to decorate to take the symbols of your people and put them out there, be they gods or allegories that are speaking about the values of the people. There's a lot of levels that were really clear. The idea of art is interesting though now because it's abstracted. Right? I think that's the whole key. Abstraction is the key that the concept of art is abstracted now. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes something that actually doesn't make sense to people because you don't have those solid roots into what is art about. Like, okay, is it about me just looking at this image as an image? It could be an image of anything. I feel something, I don't feel something. Maybe there's something I recognize in it. Maybe there's George Washington crossing the Delaware. There's something that seems significant, right? That would have, something they can get their teeth into. Uh, Norman Rockwell, that reflects aspects of the society to them. But, that's a new thing. It never really was just art abstracted from its purpose. And I think that's why people don't understand it. And when you don't understand something, they did these studies with kids that were very interesting where they gave them objects that they didn't understand what purpose these objects had. And the children immediately started to judge these objects based on the status of the person who had had it before them. No kid. So if some yeah, and this is the thing, right? This is the interesting thing, is humans are not these blank walls. Mm -hmm. We have programming. And our programming is if we don't understand an object, we immediately put it into a status classification. And if it's connected to people with a lot of status in society, which means money, fame, then immediately we will value this object highly and we'll covet it and we'll want to have it. Which I also wonder if that goes back to say, you know, ancient people eating other people, cannibalism, where they were literally trying to, you know, digest the status of a powerful person. They believed if you ate a great man, you got some of his mojo. And so the stuff goes like that. And dealers know this, especially in the blue chip market, because they literally withhold paintings from the average Joe, even if they can afford it. But if someone walks yeah. into the gallery, and has a million dollars to to throw down on a painting but they don't they're not a person of status they won't let them have the painting even if they can afford it and um yep. i mean i'm sure you've heard of this practice of course yeah, yeah. Do it. i think they do it with certain really high-end cars limited editions yeah it's wild it's wild i mean it makes it makes sense for business if you if you really want paintings to sell for insanely ridiculous amounts of money, then you're going to exploit human nature. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. isn't that what marketing is exploiting human nature, but 
Well, and it does in a weird way bring it back to the key yeah. in an odd way, right? Because again, going back to the beginnings of art, I would say it was always religious. Icon making was the very beginnings of art. And this is in a way, it does something to empower the object, right? To give it a sort of um, a quality, something larger than life, something sacred, something of a quality of awe, right? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to do that if you're going to take, you know, a can of soup and you have to find a way to elevate this into a sort of fetishistic object. I think the only way to do it is to connect it to the power, the deepest core of power in your society, mm -hmm. which is celebrity, politicians, fame, money, you know, these kind of, these kind of things. And then everybody ends up getting, not everybody, <laughs> but mm -hmm. a lot of people will experience that feeling, right? It's like, if you got, give somebody Elvis's guitar or like John Lennon's glasses, they get that. Like they could be looking at the head of John the Baptist in a church. You know, it's the same sort of relic quality. Let's say in a slightly downgraded, perverted kind of a way, but it's the same sentiment, right? Yeah. So I'm curious of if what your thoughts are about this. Why do you think that this blue chip market is not using traditional art and classical art? Or not not making not using these same practices to sell classical art, but they're only doing it with non-objective art. Okay, I would guess if I had to guess, right? It's a very mysterious thing because there's so much going on that you have to kind of pick in certain aspects of it. But I would guess that because abstract expressionism was so heavily promoted in the 1950s and 60s as the American answer to Russian social realism. The museums were collecting it, big collectors were collecting it, the Rockefellers were, there was a lot going on, right? There was a lot going on. The CIA was sponsoring shows all over Europe to try to get the Europeans to say, no, 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 go with the American way. Look how much fun, and look how much fun it is. We're wild and crazy guys, not like those Russians that are so stiff and boring, you know? This episode is brought to you in part by Rosemary Brushes. If you're one of my listeners who's a professional artist, you're already using Rosemary Brushes. But for the rest of you, come on, take your work a little more seriously. Stop buying the other brands. It's just not worth it. Every now and then you may get lucky and buy a good brush from another brand, but use the brand that professionals like myself are using. Go to rosemaryandco.com, link in the description or the show notes, and get yourself some quality brushes before your next painting. And I think once you've built that and you've put that much money into it and you've pushed it that hard and people have invested in this, it's very hard. This is like with the banks, right? You hit a point where you're too big to fail. Mm -hmm. The fallout would be massive. The amount of value lost would be massive. The anger of the people that have invested in this would be out of control. And so you just keep the game running. Mm. You, so really you think they chose off. a side and now they're stuck with it? I think so, yeah. I think that's mm. how life is. It doesn't change slowly in inches these kind of systems tend to go along until they collapse. And I think some, anything that's this heavily invested, there's a great documentary on modern art. I think it was Robert Hughes, The Shock of the New. Mm -hmm. And then he did The Shock of the New New. And I don't remember which one it was, or The New Shock of the New or something like that. But he was looking at a museum that had been built. And he's kind of glancing at this, in my opinion, horrendous modern building. But he's talking about how the budget of this thing is comparable to an aircraft carrier. And you say, this is the investment. This is what people have put. There's so much wealth in this, right? This is almost, um, it's, it's more than just an artist sitting in the studio could imagine. We're talking billions and billions of dollars. And that's all invested into this enterprise. And so until the funding dries up for it, then it's probably going, it's not going to change. And the mm -hmm. funding is supporting a whole bureaucracy, right? If you look at the National Endowment for the Arts, NIFA in New York, remember the New York Foundation for the Arts? I remember seeing this and just being shocked by it, going, this is incredible. I saw one NIFA office in New York, and it was beautiful views of the river in a nice neighborhood, big staff of people, all getting salaries and retirement. 
And basically their job, as far as I can tell, was to hand grants on to artists and decide who gets these grants and where to put the money and where to support it. I was imagining, okay, the money gets collected from the IRS and it goes to, let's say, the National Endowment for the Arts. It gets distributed to them after a while. And they have state and local subsidiaries. So that money then gets taken off big salaries. I'm sure at the national level, the salaries are even bigger and the offices are even better. And then it comes down to the state level and the local level. And then they give a few artists some thousands of dollars, you know, maybe occasionally a big half a million dollar grant that's probably less than the salary of the person running the foundation. And so you see there's this whole infrastructure of, you could say, people collecting a salary, real estate, buildings being owned. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling when we think how big this structure is. And we're an artist sitting in a studio doing something completely different and wondering why. And then we look, if we look at the scale of it, though, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I and the story, like, uh, what is it? A toilet can cost, you know, however many thousands of dollars in the military. <laughs> is that true? Yeah. I mean, there's something like this. I've, oh again, my I'm gosh. Out of my head here, but you hear these stories about mm -hmm. the amount in a bureaucracy, a simple a hammer can cost. And once it's gone through all the committees and all the places, everyone needs their piece. Everyone needs a piece of it. Huh? And then yeah. that means everybody's invested, right? See, my theory was, and I, I think I like yours better. <laughs> I think yours is probably more accurate. Or maybe there's some combination of both. But my theory was that only with completely non-objective art can you convince the public that there's something more than there is in it. So mm -hmm. it's a perfect thing to attach it yourself to. You know, if I got the red canvas with the wise chicken cross the road, you can convince people that y because you're elite, you know something they don't know. But if they look at, say, one of your paintings that's poorly done, not your painting, but a painting like yours that's poorly done by another artist, any lay person can look at it and go, yeah, those figures look weird. That's mm -hmm. not worth that's not worth a million dollars. Um, but they can't do that with something that's completely non-objective because there's nothing to compare it to. There's no there's there's no objective measurement of craftsmanship it's just mm -hmm. the thing you know that's what i've yes. always i've always thought of course mine is just speculation as well but yeah i think it's actually a really good theory and i think it explains something that is key there and my guess is we're looking at the situation where galleries were something that almost didn't exist in the past right and there were some in Rome when Caravaggio was young, you know, you read about him working with picture dealers and they did in the Netherlands, but they never had the same importance that they do now. Mm -hmm. For one, in Rome, the big, the big goal wasn't to work with a picture dealer. The big goal in Rome was to work for the Pope. So there was just a whole different hierarchy back then, you know. So as you start to look at these dealers in the 20th century, they became very important as brands. I think in the same way that, you know, Versace, Armani, these kind of things became very important in brands when you needed a brand to reach out to an international market. And so I think that's a big part of it that leads to what you're describing is in a way it allows you to make the art less important and to make the artist more replaceable. As the important thing becomes the brand of the dealer, who, let's be honest, that's where the power has been for most of the 20th century, let's say the second half anyway, um, then of course the artist suddenly becomes disposable, right? It's like the writer strike in film and they say, oh, we can replace them with AI. Well, of course they want to replace them with AI because AI, they have complete power and complete control. Mm -hmm. Where if you're dealing with a very specific artist working in a specific tradition, I mean, for one, they're very difficult to replace. And two, that tradition itself the power right every painting a classical artist makes is as good as that painting your reputation doesn't really help you out you know like a like an athlete that sort of gets fat but there's not much you know you can have the name you can have the brand but you're not going to run the race very quickly 
That's a good analogy. Like that yeah, once he stops performing, there an athlete is worthless. Mm -hmm. And but a and a traditional and artist I, is the same way. Work. But a, but a modernist not necessarily. Yeah, we could lose our eyesight, and then you know, as classical artists, we're finished. As contemporary artists, we're just getting started. Yeah, now you're more interesting because now you're painting without eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You can market that one all day long, jack the price up. So, yeah. all right. So one thought I have though, is where is your, where is your personal limit? I'm curious about this because I personally, there are there, I do have an appreciation for certain types of contemporary art or modern art. And I've had some of these people on the podcast. Um, like a few that come to mind, Aaliyah Chapin, Zoe Frank, where they they have a combination of craftsmanship, composition, and and concept. They have those, th and to me, those things are key. Those three things. Um, so I personally wouldn't throw everything modern out the window. I'm just curious, what is your, where is your personal line on when, as, when art is no longer art? Ah, okay. Well, I definitely wouldn't throw everything modern. Those painters are fantastic. So, yeah. and they're very good. And they're not so modern to me. I mean, I don't want to say that because people like to brand themselves as modern or contemporary. And but their work, has, the values in their work, are very yeah. traditional. Mm -hmm. You know, the expressiveness of the body, the design, the way the light is handled, the handling of paint. These are very traditional ideas. And the subject is modern, but that doesn't make it modern either, because you can go back and see Ghirlandaio and Filippo Lippi painting people in modern, their version of modern clothes. So I think there's, you know, there's a lot of range in there that you're still playing in a very traditional pool, even if you're on one side or the other. You know, mm -hmm. you go back to Caravaggio, and he was doing a sort of street culture of Rome painted in his paintings with the gypsies and the young guys with the swords and, you know, the attractive young boys that the Cardinals were sleeping with. This whole thing was all part of a certain, let's say, you know, hip hoppy, streety culture mm -hmm. that was going on. And so this idea of like modern and contemporary is not so new. Either, you know? So right. I, for me, you get into what I find interesting. I'm just very specifically interested in this old idea, which is art that's dealing with mythological stories or religion, preferably embedded into an architectural space that becomes, in a sense, a spiritual technology, right? That's what a church is. It's somewhere that you go and you're surrounded by brilliant architecture, beautiful painting and beautiful sculpture that are all tied together to give you an experience that some people will take drugs to get, right? Mm -hmm. to, find, to seek out... And this was a way, one of many ways that people gave themselves a meditative transcendent experience. Also, they fasted, you know, they didn't have sex for a while. They had a lot of ways to put their mind into an altered state. They would go in silence for a long time. But this was one of them. And I've become very intrigued by this idea that what they were doing in the past was fundamentally different in that way. Mm -hmm. that the deep roots are, are coming out of this sort of creating ritual space that you go into to have an experience. And so to me, the big difference in modern art is maybe that modern art is a commodity and not all, of course, you know, going back to the Dutch, they did a lot of this too. And once you get into the Baroque age and people always did it a bit, but it was never the point, you know, mm -hmm. it evolved around the spiritual context. And so, that's something that I think is really important that gets lost to me in modern art. So to answer your question, I'm very specifically focused in that. Area. More and more, I'm interested in scaling the work up, scaling up the narrative and trying to embed it into physical spaces to create a sort of a ritual, to have a ritual experience for people to mm -hmm. come in. And I'm not totally sure you can do that entirely outside of traditional religion and traditional myth and these kind of things. But to answer the question, I'm specifically into the really old stuff, like the really old, right. old stuff. Right. I'm curious 
what you mean by spirituality as it relates to your painting or even just painting in general, because spirituality is such a broad term and I hear it all the time from different people. Some people would call being a humanist spirituality where your spirituality is tied up in, in yourself. Other people say it's the universe. I mean, to you, what is spirituality, particularly as it relates to your art? I think when you go back to C.S. Lewis's idea that you can talk about the universe, you can talk about God, you can talk about all of these things and varying degrees of abstraction, but you hit a problem when you get too abstract, which is on the sort of hierarchy of consciousness and the uh, sense that Thomas Aquinas talked about it, you start to postulate something that's less conscious than a human being. And I think that becomes a problem. If you're talking about things in a spiritual way, you have to conceptualize them as being more conscious than a human being. You have to conceptualize God, the universe, you know, whatever hippie or non-hippie way you want to put it, it has to be more conscious than you. Mm. And I think this is what people understood when they were making these paintings is they said, there's a very literal way that we can talk about this. And then there's a symbolic way. And the symbolic way is to say, I can't describe this to you. I can't paint this for you, but I can create something that's like you, but more. And I think that's what Michelangelo was doing on the Sistine ceiling. And that tradition goes way back, right? That's the poetic tradition in Christian painting, predominantly in Catholicism, let's be honest, through most of history. Then they did it, the Greeks did it, the Romans did it, but it was limited. And that was their idea was we're going to make something more beautiful than you in order to let you conceptualize something of a higher consciousness level. Than you. Mm. And that was the way they had visual symbolism. That was the way they created. And I think that's still there underneath everything we do as artists, right? Why do people sit here and spend 20, 30, 40, 100, 200 hours working away at something? I think that's why I think it's, the spirituality is still deeply embedded in us, even if we don't understand it, even if we can't articulate it to ourselves, that concept is very important so to our culture. In putting in all of those hours, mm -hmm. are you suggesting that we're trying to reach our maximum potential and move closer to a higher consciousness by doing so? Is that what you're suggesting? I think that's, that's the kind of underwritten written goal of Western art. And when you go back and you see the very best, you see Michelangelo describing his process when he did, say, the Pieta. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the late Pieta in the Cathedral, the Duomo Museum in Florence, where the knees are buckling, the breath is coming out of the stomach, and he was very obsessed with this idea of touching the body of God and of death through this piece experiencing that depth very powerfully. So he had these skills in order to slightly tweak the body. So you really felt the knees buckling, right? He had to exaggerate certain things to really get your attention on these knees that don't just look bent. They look like they're giving out mm -hmm. the way the breath is falling out of the stomach and the rib cage is poking through, right? So you really feel that moment of death. And to him, that was a sort of meditation that was a way to connect to something bigger. And where am I going with this exactly? I think where I'm going with it is I meant, that- Yeah, reaching a higher consciousness, I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think it, that it was a meditation for him, right? This was a way to connect to something larger and bigger and more beautiful and more powerful. And everything he did was geared to that. He was obsessed with that idea. And I think a lot of these artists were, a lot of the best ones, and so I do wonder, you know, even for a painter who's just painting a bowl of fruit, there's an element of naturalism in that, right? There's an element of that 19th century idea that simply by looking at the basket of fruit, you're also seeing a reflection of the divine. You're seeing a reflection of the biggest thing in life present in the products that it creates. There's something religious in that act of observing that basket of fruit with that attention that otherwise from our rational mind, maybe it doesn't deserve that much attention. And so I think it's inescapable in art that we're dealing with something more specifically spiritual. Mm. 
Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And what, you know, when I posted my crucifixion recently, I got I, I'm mostly just positive response, but I got a, I got a few critiques and one of them was that Christ wouldn't have been so beautiful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, and I thought, who cares? Like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to describe something bigger than me, something better than me, something more beautiful, something divine, uh, or as you put it, a higher consciousness. And, and I couldn't think of another way to do it besides idealizing the figure on some level. And I think it's the right way to do it, right? Because yeah. what that person is saying to you is I either don't understand or I reject the whole tradition of art, which let's be honest, if you're painting a crucifixion, that's an idea that would have been a little controversial. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the idea of representing a God is, is something that comes along out of this tradition that wasn't there in the beginning, right? So you're by definition, you're playing with a tradition that has rules. And you can't say, okay, this guy may have looked like the big Lebowski, but he said all these amazing things. That's not there in your painting. A painting as a painting, its no. own visual world, right? It has its own rules. It has its own way of communicating. It's poetry. And I think beauty is the way it does that, right? Whether it's beauty of design, beauty of color, beauty of the body, there's all these things that that's the language. It'd be like reading Shakespeare and saying, you know, people don't talk like that. Mm -hmm. No, they don't, it's poetry. It's a very refined, polished version of how people speak. And that's a funny thing. I think that's another part of what we're talking about is maybe culturally, our culture doesn't really understand the concept of beauty. Mm -hmm. I think that's something and the significance of beauty has been put aside, right? And I think you see that when people talk about building cities now. And the cities are not beautiful like they used to be. And people will try to break it down into an abstract concept and say, well, you know, the buildings should be so many stories high. They should be set up to the curb by this much. They should, you know, have a maybe this wide of an alley. And they're approaching everything dissecting these old cities, trying to figure out why they're beautiful, but they're not willing to use the term beauty because it's seen as backwards and unscientific. But again, what they don't understand is beauty is a concept that encompasses more complex concepts that are actually too complex for our rational brain to understand. And that's what poetry is, right? That's what music is. That's what beauty is. Beauty is the concept that we experience it and we know it's there, but we're generally not intelligent enough or articulate enough to make rules to prescribe how to do it. And so we use the term beauty as a catch all to say, this is what you're going for. You want to create beauty. And of course, beauty again is an abstract concept, you know, in a platonic sense, you can say beauty, the abstract of beauty, but then beauty manifests in specific ways on the planet, right? Like there's a beauty of Renaissance painting. There's a beauty that Michelangelo was tapped into. There's a beauty of Japanese painting. There's, there's the pure abstract of beauty, and then it becomes less and less and less and less abstract. But they're all kind of coming from the same place, right? They're all embodying this bigger idea in the same way every culture in the world has a classicism that really have a lot in common. Like Chinese painting has a lot in common with Dutch painting, actually. Classical. And so I think that's the interesting thing with painting is people have all these different things to say, oh, you painted Jesus, maybe he wouldn't look like that. But what they're forgetting is that painting has its own language if it's going to be successful. It's poetry, right? Just like in poetry, you have certain repeated rhythms that go over and over and over again, and they make it poetry. And in painting, we have certain repeated forms and certain repeated colors, and that's what makes it poetic. And so that beautiful figure that's a little idealized, you're sort of moving towards a regular mathematical form, right? And as you move towards that regular mathematical form, like a Greek statue would be the perfect description of this, that form becomes poetic. 
through its mathematic and repet- mathematics and its repetition. Mm. Yeah. So speaking of beauty, let's talk about composition. You had mentioned composition earlier, and I expressed to you that that's the lesson that has been, I've been really struggling to learn of the importance of composition. And as a multi-figure painter, it is, my personal feeling is, it is really complicated to compose a multi-figure painter or a multi, it is really complicated to compose a multi-figure painting. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What are your thoughts on composition? How do you implement it into your work? I mean, from a technical standpoint, and uh, from a aesthetic standpoint. In other words, what is your feelings on composition, but also how do you technically apply it with something so complicated as like the painting behind you where there's like 40 figures in it? Yeah, and these are two of four panels that they make a big freeze. And I think the way I thought about it, particularly when I was composing these, right? When you see all four together, you see that it's a big long freeze. And the frieze being a concept that comes out of architecture, right? You go back to the Pantheon and you have that big frieze or the Parthenon, excuse me. You have that big frieze of writers and there's the battle scenes with centaurs and there's all these amazing, just long, long panels. And so I got really into this idea again, going back to architecture and these pieces coming out of temples and churches that are all based in the building structure. That as you come out of the middle ages, you see the architectural form and the figures are very close, right? They're angels in the form of columns standing in a row. And as you go more into realism, that structure loosens. But my thoughts of design were very similar that you start with a tight, tight structure. And then you bring the realism into that tight, tight structure, um, which was a big change for me when I thought about it that way. Instead of mm-hmm. saying, you know, in the old, I thought about what would this thing have actually looked like? And then I try to impose some order on it. And at a certain point I went, no, no, I'm just gonna start with the order, with the strong design, the design that is the, the structure of the song, right? The series of rhymes and the choruses in a certain point, and I'll lay out that design and I'll fit the realism on top of that. So would and you that, say it's look, kind of like creating a melody and then putting in the words instead of the other way around? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought a lot about that, you know, and I listened to these lectures of, um, I forget his name. He was a very traditional Southern Baptist scholar, let's say, who was teaching at some university in Alabama, teaching the classics and the Bible in a really old fashioned way. And it was beautiful. And I realized from listening to his descriptions of certain books, certain Greek books, certain Roman books, biblical books, that a book in the old days was designed like a building. You had the center of the whole book, right? The very center word, the quarters, and that there was a mathematical structure and all of these events took place within this mathematical structure. I think it was, maybe it was the Agamemnon I was reading. And I realized that this key change happens right in the center of the book where the action switches to a different category and this key event takes place, which changes everything. Hmm. And so I realized there's this old way of thinking about these things that was true in literature. It was true in um, architecture. It was true in painting. It was a very structured, symmetrical way of thinking about image making. And that those things all tied together. So when I got into that, I said, oh, okay, they did that. And then they approached their narrative in a classical way too which was a very detailed way, right? If you read the Iliad and you hear of the Greeks going into battle with the Trojans, he describes everything down to the smallest detail, the people loading, you know, feeding the horses. He describes the armor and the helmets of everybody. And then when I got to Florence, I saw these big battle paintings in the Palazzo Vecchio by Vasari. And I realized, wait, he's doing the whole thing here. That's why it looks so different. I couldn't figure out, why are these so different? You know, they're beautifully painted, but they don't resemble anything real that I've thought about as a painter, you know, they're so far from the illustrations I was used to looking at when I was young. And it dawned on me, he's telling a story in that same classic way. So you'll have 18 layers of depth with figures that are just this big way in the back, but they'll be detailed out too. They'll have a certain haircut. You know, he's even 
giving them sandals of a certain kind, and they're loading cannonballs into the cannon, the ships are sailing into the harbor. All these things that happened in different moments of time were combined to tell you the whole story. Mm. And so in, I think they started with what story did they want to tell in detail and a tight structure to fit it into. And then the realism came in, right? Then the special effects maybe came in. But I think they started with a very structured way of thinking about narrative and a structured way of thinking about design. And it was formal because you think you go back to that tradition, you had to fit your figures uh, into the architectural space. There's a very famous piece by Raphael in, uh, I want to say, Santa Maria del Pace. Anyway, it's been a long day. I hope that I got the name of the church right. But there's a beautiful painting of some symbols, and there's an arc in the middle. And the figures are leaning on this arch. They're playing around. They're sort of in a beautiful, dynamic way filling the space. And it was a very famous painting up to, say, you know, the 20th century. And when I went to see it, I was a little surprised at first because it's, it's roughly painted. It's not one of these pieces that Raphael went in and polished everything and did the perfect drawing. There's definitely things where the assistants were in there. And I was thinking like, okay, to my training, this doesn't make any sense. Why is this piece so famous? And then was the more I looked at it, I went, ah, oh, it's the design. It's the way he's able to fit these figures into the space. And that was really important mm. to them that day. And also the idea of creating beautiful people. That's another one that we have a hard time getting our head around because we tend to think politically about these things, right? We don't want to fat shame somebody. We don't want to say they have an ugly nose, whatever it is. We don't want to make people feel bad. We're all beautiful, which is a modern kind of idea. And it's a political idea and it's a social idea. But they weren't really thinking like that. They were thinking much more along the lines of simply how do you communicate the spiritual through an image? And beauty was their way of doing that, right? So there's all these kind of structured parameters. And again, their idea of beauty was very mathematical. Maybe it was a figure of eight heads. Maybe it was 10 heads. You know, Durer had his ideas. Pontormo had his. And to us, again, that seems so strange. We would go, why would you have everybody have the same amount of heads? Assuming they're grown adults, right? Children were different. And I think, again, they started with structure and then introduced accidents into structure. Instead of us, we'll draw the model. Well, I'm a bit less like this now, but mostly we'll draw the model. And we'll maybe think like, okay, I have this weird idea of proportions of heads, but why would I use it? Because it's not going to help me get the drawing any better. Uh, I'm just gonna look and see the shapes. And I think for those guys, they did two things differently, right? They started there, and then they also imagined all the forms in perspective, more like maybe a comic artist would today or an animator. And so it made sense for them to have this model that they would then project into perspective and start to build up a world based on, again, repetition, right? They were playing the game of that one painting and saying, I'm gonna repeat these patterns and these proportions again and again and again. And the interesting thing, is those proportions were repeated in the architecture as well. If you look at like an Andrea del Sarto fresco, there's some in Florence here, and the architecture will have similar proportions to the figures too. They can divide it into eighths and quarters, and you start to see the same figures then are divided into eighths in the eight head model. And you start to recognize, again, this like subtle repetition that just goes through everything in a kind of musical way, right? Hmm. Could you be a little more specific on what your structure is when starting a painting? What does that structure look like? I mean, is it broken down into sections of eight? Is it the golden mean? I mean, what is this structure that you're working in? I would say my structure is a little simpler. Um, I tend to avoid the golden mean. Why is that? I go more... Well, because I don't find it as practical for my purposes. Okay. Uh, more into eighths and quarters and proportions like this, because I find, again, you know, you can divide the space of the picture easily into eighths and quarters. You can divide the figures if you want to. You can, um, it's just, it's applicable. It's flexible. You know, I find that it, it just works for me to have an easy division 
that I can keep referring back to. I just have to take a minute to thank each one of my generous patrons for your part in keeping this podcast going. I could not continue to do it without you, so thank you so much. If you're not a patron yet, but you love the show and you listen regularly, please consider becoming a patron. It's really easy to do and it doesn't have to break the bank. Just head over to theundrapedartist.com and click on the link, Be My Patron on Podbean. And then choose a monthly donation amount that fits your budget. It's that simple. And to thank you for your generous donations, once you've reached $100 in total contributions, send me an email to theundrapedartist at gmail.com and I will send you one of our spectacular undraped artist aprons. Um, and so in these paintings in particular, of course there's four, you only see two of them, be, but I started with four pieces. The figures move across the space from left to right. The whole scene unfolds here, flows across and hits over here. And again, we're already dealing with a tight structure, right? It's very defined. It's a freeze, it's four panels. Each panel represents a certain part of the narrative. And then once I go into that panel, I'll get a few big horizontal and vertical lines that I'll put in, and then I'll quickly start to go a bit baroque, you know, I'll start to work spirals in. And maybe this is an intuitive sort of not defined aspect of the golden ratio. But you have no figures at this point? This is just an abstract design? No, I'm sort of building it out of groups of figures, right? Okay. I tend to think of groups of, so I want the figures to not just be isolated people standing there. I think of like, okay, this group is doing this, this group is doing that, which again is a concept that goes back to literature. If you read a Greek play, you have the chorus and you have the actor, right? So I tend to think of my paintings like that. There'll be certain actors that jump out and are the key protagonists in the scene, but there's a chorus that surrounds them. That's sort of a big nondescript group of figures. They're, they're significant. They have a role to play, but not every figure can be equal, right? Mm. And so I think of drama that way. And I also like to think of it as a stage designer on top of that, right? So you're a dramatic playwright in a sense. You have your chorus, you have your main actor, and then you have your stage. And the stage doesn't have to stop at the end, right? It can flow off so it can feel a bit more natural. Figures can be coming on and off stage in the wings. But I was always very intrigued by this idea when you see Bernini, Francois Boucher, Da Vinci, that these guys were also putting on theatrical performances. And we look now and we see these works of art that they left. But we forget they did a lot of things that disappeared for court entertainment, for you know weddings, for feasts. They would throw up big arches with an allegory of how great the Duke was that would come down after a week. And so these guys, I think, were part stage designer, part lighting expert, part drama, uh, part dramatist, even fashion designers. You know, you look at Da Vinci and he's designing haircuts and people's outfits. They were sort of approaching the whole thing that way. And I think just like you would structure a drama with the chorus and the main characters, you would do that here too. And of course, these guys were very influenced by Aristotle's ideas on drama and Aristotle's ideas on storytelling in general. And these, there was a few books available that were influential and they were very based on the classic drama. So that's kind of how I think about my scenes out. And then plus those big groups of figures give you a sort of a way to fit them into the scene, right? You can make a more classic thing where you have these just straight groups of figures that form a big square. And then the fact that you have these tightly grouped figures in a mass, like you'll see in Andrea del Sarto and Raphael at times. And then you get this interesting thing that goes back to almost like um, a herd of columns, right? And each one becomes different and interesting in its own way. And it's this sort of concept of taking a regular structure and then putting as much interesting variety into that structure as you can without destroying the structure. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think there's a good time to look at your paintings because this is really interesting, but I'm not sure I completely understand it, to be honest with you. Okay, so let's say this one right here is 
man, your work is, I don't know if I've told you already, but it's just extraordinary. It's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. And thank look you. at so those yours. flat. Thank you. Look at those flesh tones. Just awesome. <laughs> yeah. I was using a really, let's say a bigger palette when I painted this one, I've, my palette the last few years has been getting smaller and smaller. Why is that? Why very... have you gone to a more minimal palette? You know, I think it comes from going, spending a lot of time in Venice and getting really into Tintoretto. Okay. And one of the things I love about Tintoretto and Titian, but mostly Tintoretto, was this idea that he made these remarkable, gigantic, epic paintings, and he did them with the least possible effort, let's say. And I don't mean that in a, in a shallow way, right? I think he was so good at realizing when I look at this scene, there are certain things that have to be right. And he got those things right, generally speaking, you know, so his perspective was perfect. The light and the shadow was beautiful and expressive and articulated. The figures were beautifully, dynamically drawn with all the overlaps and the foreshortening. And he realized you can get rid of a lot of stuff in a painting. And if mm. you get these things going to read, so I became very intrigued by that idea. How much can I drain out and focus you on those big dynamic elements of the painting, you know? Yeah. Where when I was doing this and not, it's, it's like choosing between your children, which, which one do you like better? But this was a period where I was really into the texture and the color and the surface before I spent this time in Venice and realized, wow, Tintoretto is doing this in such a bare bones fashion. And there's such a power, you know, there's this raw, like dynamic power. Hmm. Yeah. I need to get to Italy and see some of this stuff. Well, okay. So <laughs> maybe you could break this down for me. Maybe help me understand a little bit better how this one is okay. structured and how, how you came to this result. Well, this one is very much a sort of a Renaissance structure, right? If you look at it, there's one big box in the center compositionally. Right. All these figures, there's a big box literally, and all the figures are following the pattern of that box. They're all working around it. So you have this very tight, repetitive structure, a figure here, a figure on the other side. They tend to match, right? It's very symmetrical. Yeah. And it's even working on a plane. Everybody's arranged on a plane. And then into that plane, you have to bring it to life now, right? So I want to bring that box to life. So what I'm trying okay, to do- Okay, but before you go further, why, why did you start with a box? Was there something significant about oh. the box? Is it just arbitrary? Yeah. No, it's because it's, again, it's something I noticed. Take, for instance, Botticelli. I really noticed this in Botticelli's work that his work was so sweet and so over the top, his beautiful curls and pretty babies and all of these things. And I was looking at it going, why does this work? Why does this not feel like a Hallmark card? And not just because the figures are very beautiful, that's part of it, because I realized his structure was very tight. There's a very tight containing structure. Um, and that is an aesthetic thing that I came to really like. Also in Michelangelo, of course, the guy that carves out of a block of marble, all that life, right? It's always contained by the box. And so you can get all this energy, but it's contained, or all this emotion, but it's contained by a tight structure. So it doesn't go crazy. It's not just wild shit, excuse my language. I hope that's okay, flying that's everywhere. Yeah. It, it's this kind of order. There's an underlying order that contains all the emotion. This is my idea. Hmm. So now I can start getting into this scene where every figure can get very intense. It can get very emotional. They can get, they can communicate, they can interact. But as long as they don't break out of this structure, it's going to hold together like that poem still, right? It's going to have the meter, the rhyme, the repetition. So it stays in the realm of poetry and doesn't just become a bunch of people shouting at each other. And I think that allows you to look at the piece for a long time too, right? If, I, if everything just is going crazy everywhere, it can become a bit, chaotic to look at a bit painful um and i think of that when i see um let's say well the david right classic example michelangelo had this very tight block of marble without a lot of room for error and so inside of that block of marble his shape is very tight but he got all the action and movement built into the figure the human figure that he could 
and all that intensity you see it in the move, moving rippling kind of quality of the torso that is contained energy so maybe that's the best way to put it with all that roundabout is it's a way of trying to create contained energy hmm okay let's look at another one maybe in in because i i'm sorry i'm slow and i'm still trying to figure this out here um but let's look at another one and maybe you could okay here's one so tell me about the structure on this one okay this one is after after one of my trips to venice where i had just really started getting into tintoretto and so what i started to do here was i built a sort of a spiral movement into the piece right moving from the lady in the front curving up around the falling Saddam Hussein at the top. Okay. And you can see there's still a balance. There's big vertical lines. There's I'm echoing figures on one side or the other, but it's a bit of a looser structure on this one where I was saying, instead of a box, I'm going to build a spiral into space and I'm going to build every figure tightly, tightly, tightly into that big okay, mass. Okay, I see it now. Spiral. So again, you've got all. Yeah, this you've basically action, got right? one big shape. You've got a J almost, like a tilted J here, and yeah. everything is on there. Not everything, but the main <laughs> elements of the painting are confined to that initial simple shape. And that's something that Tintoretto would do in his paintings, and he took it, I think, because his motto was the color of Titian, the drawing of Michelangelo. I think that's something that could have come from The Last Judgment, right? When you look at the way Michelangelo composed The Last Judgment, he has these big masses of figures that are all very tightly grouped together. Mm. And that's that same I was going for here, is you still have a big shape, but within that shape, you can fill it with a spiral of energy and noise, but it's contained like a tornado, right, in this funnel. Okay. And that funnel movement again keeps it from getting crazy it keeps it from having just stuff bouncing off in its own disorder patterns all over the place yeah okay it finally clicked you must think i'm so slow if not my home tire audience does <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i just want to make sure i understand it's a things. weird concept right it's backwards if you start like we did studying naturalism it's sort of a weird concept to think oh wait you could just start with this other structure and then try to fit reality into it. It seems backwards. Yeah, well, if not backwards, counterintuitive, because <laughs> you sort of touched on this earlier. It's really easy, particularly as a narrative painter, to just focus too hard on the narrative. How do I tell the story and forget about a structure, forget about design, forget about all those things and just be like, well, so and so would have been standing here because he would have been talking to this person and this person would have been doing this and that and to get hung up on the narrative and then somehow come in later swoop in and try and tie it all together with some reasonable composition and you're yeah you're flipping that and saying okay this painting i'm starting with a box how can i get yeah. this whole narrative tied into this basic structure this one i'm starting with this <laughs> this spiral or as I put it, a J shape, and then how can I, how can I tell this story but confine it to that shape? And it makes perfect yeah. sense because it simplifies, mm -hmm. not simplifies, it it creates bound boundaries mm -hmm. and helps you avoid complete chaos. Exactly right, and it goes back to the dramatic concept too, that it's the structure of the drama, right? There's the chorus. And there's the main actors and the chorus just sort of fades into the mass. Yeah. And so you can start to create that thing of boom, 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 right? Rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three. And you can, and one note can stand out. Right? Dun, 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 mm -hmm. dun, 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 dun. And so you can have a big group of figures and then one figure jumps out and that's the figure you're going to notice right away. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of, uh, I think that's a thing that in realism, people tend to approach that tonally, right? And they say everything in this painting is going to be kind of dark or mid-tone. And then I'm going to put a dramatic light in here and go, wham, you're going to notice that because the light's hitting it. And I think this is the same thing sort of more linearly or more um, form-based, right? You can have a whole mass of forms stuck together and then one form kind of jumps out from that big mass of simpler, more unified form. 
and that form becomes the dominant form. Hmm. And I, this is something that, again, I was looking, uh, thinking a lot about the Sistine ceiling with that, because I, to me, it's just a fantastic painting. And I liked how simple his means were for communicating what he was trying to communicate. There was line, there was a little bit of light and shadow, very basic color, right? So you start to see this thing that he's relying very much on form and line as the expre expressive factors. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. It's sort of like you're going from, say, with all the light effects and all the drama, like a Steven Spielbergian kind of a thing. And suddenly you're, you know, making a French art film with black and white and, you know, one natural light source. And it's a, it's an interesting approach to it. You know, I think it's, um, it has a different effect. It has made, maybe there's a reason the Sistine ceiling is just stays in people's minds. You know, you close your eyes and you just, you can't forget those scenes. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing this because I am absolutely going to be thinking about this from now on. It's very, very helpful. So another comment I want to make about your work is, my gosh, dude, you're prolific. Because I paint a lot. You paint what? A lot? I paint a lot, yeah. Yeah, I guess my you schedule. do. Because uh, this stuff is hard to paint. You know, you've got, you've probably painted more figures in your career than anyone I've ever met. Um, I mean, if you combine all your paintings and all the figures in the paintings, it's unbelievable. And I yeah, assume you know, some I, of them are life-size yeah. even, some of them are quite large. Yeah, a lot of these are big. These are all, these on the bottom, I think these are all from 2013, 14. Those are all life-size. These, this one is not on the bottom left. Those, that's a smaller painting, but the rest are all pretty much life size. And where do paintings like this go? I mean, there aren't a lot of homes these with walls are... this big. <laughs> so far, there's a few. I, you know, I've been lucky to get some are commissions, some were bought by collectors, but yeah, so far I've managed to sell most of them. It took a while when I started doing big paintings. I found, um, there was a period where I hit the wall, you know, where I had been doing smaller, less ambitious things. And then I started to go big and it took a while to catch up. Mm -hmm. But once it did, I was, I, I'm glad it, it did. You know, it's, it's a different kind of a thing because also there's a part of you that says, if I'm going to paint 20 figures in this, painting it small seems like such a waste of effort because you have to go through all the same design. I know all the same <laughs> composition. Yeah, And the gallery goes, well, a four foot painting, right? And you're going, yes, technically, <laughs> technically it's a four foot painting, but there's a lot of thought that went into it. So I find financially also, I mean, not to say that's it because this is what I want to be doing. You know, I, right. I would be painting only like ceilings if that's, if that was the life that, that would be my dream, let's say, yeah. you know. One of the things about your painting that I find really interesting is I don't know how to put it. Your figures, they're, they're, they're not, they're almost stylized in a way, but yet they're so lifelike and realistic at the same time. And it makes me really curious about how you put these paintings together. How much of this is done from imagination? How much of this is done from observation? Well, it varies, you know, I think these days there's probably more done from imagination. Um, I used more photo reference in the past. I still do sometimes, but I use definitely more in the past, but I would always start with an idea with a drawing and it would be an imaginary drawing. Yeah. And then I would try to fit those things into my imaginary drawing. So there was this process of having to change everything and distort everything to match my imaginary drawing, right? And over time, I've gotten more and more involved in the drawing part of it. So I'm spending more time working on imaginary drawings and trying to develop that as much as I can. And then, like for the ones behind me, I did a full drawing from imagination. I then did individual studies of individual figures where I tried to uh, match what I had in my imagination, but, you know, develop them a little further, which using the model allowed me to do. 
And then I did a final drawing trying to tie all that together. And so that process has gotten more and more elaborate and taken up more of my attention over the years. Um, and so there's a, there's a thing where they're, they're there, they're, the light is there. I'm trying to treat the light in a more or less realistic way, you know, simplifying it a bit here and there. But the forms are kind of forms that I've halfway imagined and halfway observed. But I'm trying to say, okay, even if I've changed this form, I can still kind of see how the light's going to fall on that form. Because as a volume, you know, maybe her rib cage is a bit longer, it's a bit tighter, it's the hips are exaggerated, the neck is elongated, but you've still got forms that are being hit by light. And even if they're elongated or widened or stretched or compressed, or if the the attitude is exaggerated, it's the light's still going to hit those forms in the same way, right? So I can kind of figure out, okay, this is the form I'm creating here. I can bend it a little bit from nature and then sort of look at the planes that are facing up, the planes that are facing down, which direction is the light coming from. And you can kind of figure out that this area will be darker, this area will be lighter. But I always liked that. You know, I always, Ruben's always appealed to me for this, that he creates these forms that are so far off the mark from realism because he's exaggerating the turns and the twists and everything, right? The hair is filled with ripples and the drapery is blowing and the figures are even kind of swirling a bit. And yet that light and that texture is so believable on his people and the anatomy is really sound that you accept it. I always find that to be the most interesting thing that you can create a vision of reality that's a little pushed and isn't quite real, but you believe it's real. So did the process dictate the style of your figures and your paintings, or were you after a particular look, so you developed a process that would give you that look? I think a little of both, you know, I was definitely after, I've been after a certain look, but I also had to make peace with the fact after a while that my hand just has its way of doing things. I remember really drawing a lot from imagination to try to make these scenes. And at a certain point, I realized I was arguing with my fingers. They wanted to draw certain shapes. And then I went, okay, what, what if I just sort of let them go and accept that there's a certain tendency that just seems to be built in here to create forms a certain way? And so there's those two together, right? Like you have, I have an idea of what I want it to look like, but also my, my own brain, my own body, whatever it is, has an idea of its own. Hmm. That probably is a combination of education, nature, who knows, you know? Yeah. I find it really, really interesting. The distortions. I mean, this figure is so, I mean, it's not. I've, I've never seen a woman like that. And yet you render it so convincingly that I believe it. And that's the thing. That's my, that, thank you. That's what I'm trying to do is to create these forms, but make you believe them. Yeah. And I think there's people, even contemporary artists doing that. Like you think of John Curran, maybe, you know, I'd say Odd Nerdrum, they're sort of creating these forms that are not realistic forms. Mm -hmm. And then rendering them to where you sort of, that's the idea, right? Try to trick people into believing it. Yeah. Yeah. I like it because it sort of, it just animates things a bit, you know? If you can twist those forms a bit, it's just like, you're, it's, it's this playful sort of movement that crawls into the painting that's just sort of like swirling and flowing a little bit. Mm-hmm. And in this particular one, you really see that Renaissance influence in the landscape, too. Yeah, this was one of the first ones I did with that light background. Yeah. Where it was very dark for a while. And then I started to just, occasionally I come back to that. I always find it hard. I don't know. I find dark paintings much easier to resolve. But that light, sunny, clear, beautiful kind of Renaissance Mediterranean feel like this sort of little fantasy land that I want to be, you know, I want to be there myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the same way. I agree with you. I, I think you can, you can hide a lot in shadows. 
<laughs> and when you when you and illuminate an a painting, beautiful. you're 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 naked. It's like everything's got to be just so. It does, and and everything has to be explained in a different way, right? It's almost like you have to let things go in the lights on a light painting, mm -hmm. where you have to let things go in the dark in a dark painting, right? Like you can kind of unify the darks on a dark painting, and it took and it's it's tricky, like. I find still unifying the lights in a way, right? Like trying to make sure the sky is basically the same value as the flesh is sort of, I think, how I was thinking about this one. And that's very counterintuitive to me after all the academic painting I did. To go, yeah. like, I'm just going to move those lights out in the sky and the flesh and the water. And I'll just kind of make it all the same and then go in and like play in the shadows a bit. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the opposite you know now tell me about the dogs there's something <laughs> the dog. something so human about them which i love one of the things i so i worked entirely from life for a long time and one of the things that i liked about it was that you would end up with these sort of naive for lack of a better word, naive solutions. And because things move, things change. If I painted an animal, it would often be, yeah, you could tell it was a donkey, but there was, there was so much of myself in it trying to wade through that incredible challenge of painting a moving animal that it would end up looking more human than donkey, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I see that mm -hmm. a little bit in your animals and I find it, I find it awesome. Like that's one of the things I was attracted to when I started painting that way. Uh, because it's so easy when yeah. you're working from photographic reference, just to be literal, like that's the dog. That's exactly what I see. Those are the exact shapes, but this is charming. So I wonder well, I like that. how you, if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's something that I remember reading, and this is, I don't know where I read this, somewhere talking about how certain animals have eyebrows, I think dogs, mm -hmm. and how I could be completely making this up, but let's say it's an idea that influenced me anyway, that when Leonardo and some of these Renaissance guys painted horses, they gave them expressive eyebrows too. Yeah. You know, made their faces move in an almost human way. Yeah. And they did these lions that don't look anything like lions, but they're this fish and whales that are, to me, far more interesting than a real whale in a pictorial sense. Mm -hmm. there's, mm -hmm. there's a beauty that when you have that naivety, it makes it like your imagination has to fill in the blanks. And I think that's why these Roman history paintings were so fascinating in the Renaissance, because they didn't really know anything about, they knew some things about Rome, but they hadn't got it down to an archaeological science yet. So when they painted the triumph of Caesar, it was this bizarre Fellini-esque scene that was partly Renaissance, partly Roman, so over the top. Amazing ruins sprouting out of the top of mountains and costumes that are just more ceremonial in some kind of a 16th century orgy than a Roman soldier would have ever worn, you know? It's just like it becomes this weird space that the artist creates. Mm -hmm. And I always liked that. I thought that was interesting. That sort of thing that does come from not having as much information. Yeah. That it gives you to sort of interpret things in a more, well, it lets your personality come in a little bit, right? It sort of lets, um, it again lets your personality come in and unify that world through your personality, which I think is powerful because anytime you gear towards unity in a painting, I think it's, it gives it character, you know? That's true. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, because if you are, are on, at least on some level painting from imagination in every area of the painting, you can't help but to unify it because your hand is going to be the unifying factor. Yeah, and your approach to solving form problems, right? right. How do you conceptualize form? That's yeah. just going to come out. That's right. And it's going to be the same. Like the one that comes to mind is the dogs, the mushrooms, the figures over here. They're really very similar effects. You know, the shadows fall the same way from the mushrooms that they do from the figure on the ground. 
mm-hmm. the colors sort of same way in the same way. Like the le- the least inf- the less information you have, like the more you have to fall back on your sort of mental conception of form, you know. Yeah. So how did you? I'm curious. How did you do these dogs? <laughs> well, these dogs I definitely had photographs for. Um, a couple of them. One is well, my old dog. One is a friend's dog, and the other two are probably I looked at many pictures of dogs right it's not just one photo of a dog in this pose though yeah no no i did a bunch i did little drawings based on looking at a lot of dogs right and trying to figure out how did i want this to happen because the most important thing i wanted was he's being eaten by these dogs Mm -hmm. and i wanted them to um just have this sort of ferocious feeling but i wasn't against having it be in a bit of that naive way, right? I didn't yeah. want it to be, you know, like the cover of a heavy metal magazine or something, but I wanted that sort of playful lightness you see in a Renaissance painting where the lion is there, but the lion could be asking for a treat. He could be bite. It's just this sort of weird in the middle zone, you know? Hmm. Yeah, it is and there just- because, I mean, you're not even drawing blood on this. No, so it no, does make it's... you question what is what is the intention of that dog? Yeah, and he's not really reacting to the dogs. He's sort of there almost as an icon. There's just a lot of it's that idea in the Renaissance again, right, where you can have multiple moments happening at one time because you're telling the whole story. Yeah, and I think that's sort of a way to describe it, right? which you could see as an excuse to be lazy and say there's different moments in this painting that don't really have to structurally relate to each other, but they do relate in a narrative way, even if they don't relate in a totally temporal action kind of a way, you know? Mm-hmm. Like you see in the back, the story of Diane and Acteon, they're hunting, him and his friends are hunting in the forest. They come across this little pond where uh, Diana is bathing with her nymphs. And you're not allowed to see her naked. So she turns the hunter into a deer and his dogs devour him. Hmm. And so it's all there in the painting, right? His hunting friends in the background, him transforming, mid-transformation, the dogs turning on him, her bathing with the nymphs, the nymphs skinning the meat from their own hunt. Like all these kind of elements are there that wouldn't necessarily all be there in the same moment happening that way. Right sort of renaissance way of thinking about putting form together and i like it because there's something then that happens that becomes a different sense of time and it sort of allows you more freedom to play with reality because these elements aren't actually all sort of together in the way that they logically would be right you're creating an artificial space with these women skinning the deer over here, his friends looking over the rock. There's these, it's like a, Hmm. like a stage, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm working on a painting, another biblical painting right now where the man is lowered through the ceiling who has palsy and he's being healed by Christ. And, um, and I'm coming at it as though it's just a moment in time. I'm capturing a moment in time. And, I'm trying to think of how I would do it with in the way you think in this or in this Renaissance way that you put it, where you're taking several moments. It's almost like you've got because you're working with one image, Mm -hmm. unlike a director of a play, you have to get you have to get so much mileage out of that one image. So what you do is you take or what you're doing is you're taking three different scenes or four different scenes and you're cramming them into one image in order to tell a bigger story more of the story whereas what i did was i just took a millisecond of one scene and tried to tell the story and i like what you're doing Um, well it creates a different sense of time right yeah like yours is more like caravaggio or it's like a clap of thunder it's all just there right What, what i'm doing is looking back at say like um well some of the early flemish painters right that are they're painting, they move in this slow kind of time where there's four little blades of grass and a frog is eating a fly. And then over here, there's a little mountain and there's people up on top of the mountain. 
and like Jesus is crucified in the front, but in the background, you can see him carrying his cross up a little path. And they sort of created these meditate, these tools of meditation. Hmm. So you're meditating on the story where I think what you're describing is a sort of counter reformation style, right? The Baroque where they, they wanted to make a big emotional impact on you. So they just hit you with that moment all at once. And they got rid of all the extraneous distractions which was a decision, I think, that really came out of the Council of Trent in the 16th century dealing with the Protestant Reformation. Like the Catholic Church said, okay, we would need to make things a bit more direct here to appeal to people. Instead of all these like funny little visual games that are going on in these Renaissance paintings, let's shape up the ship here and get serious. And mm. I think that's when you start paintings like Caravaggio, right? He's probably the most mature manifestation of that kind of painting where it really started to coalesce into something new and interesting. And I think that's just two time conceptions. Right. And deciding what's important, right? Is it sort of like slowly meditating on the story or is it hitting the person with that big dramatic impact of this is the focus. This is where I want you to look, right? This is what's significant in an emotional way. The peak drama. Do you ever flip flop? between the two different types? I do, yeah. I, I haven't in a little while. I've been doing a lot of this recently. But then I'll sit there and close my eyes sometimes and think, oh, I just really want to make a big, powerful, simple painting, you know? Yeah, I wonder if I can, man, there's so many great paintings. And they, yeah, you're right. It's like five different scenes in this. Yeah. <laughs> it's really so many things. cool. <laughs> And All it's right, fun. So well, this might one, right? be an impact <laughs> one, right? Or no? Yeah, that's a little simpler. That was a very playful piece I made, um, sort of combining this idea of the naive, innocent satyr, who's a sort of nature creature, mm -hmm. coming across, first of all, a tree, which has echoes of the Garden of Eden. But secondly, these figures that are have grown into trees in Dante's Inferno. And offhand, I don't remember what circle of hell they were in, but there maybe it was the suicides that grew into trees. And so you have this sort of like an, half animal, half human, very natural creature coming face to face with this very dark thing that it doesn't quite understand. And yeah, that was a very simple, direct kind of narrative. Yeah. And this is very small, small painting. Yeah, this is a small one. Yeah, I can tell just by the paint quality, the brushwork, it just feels like compressed a little bit. Yeah, more hatchy. Yeah, more hatchy, yeah. Um, how big was this one? Does it, is it written here? I'm just curious. That must have been... Oh, it's tiny. 12 by 24, yeah. that's little. <laughs> yeah, that was a little one. Oh, my goodness. It's nice with little wood panels. You know, you can still get some detail in there, even at a small scale. Wow. But... That's, 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 do you a, still own this one or do you sell this one? No, I sold that one. I think I did that in a show in 2016. Yeah, it seems like this yeah. would have uh, sold quickly. Yeah, the small ones always go. Yeah. Well, usually. Okay. Well, man, I could just talk about your paintings all day. But is there, uh, is there anything about the process we haven't talked about that you, that you find particularly interesting about your process or that you're particularly proud of? And that's not a question I ask very often, but the reason I'm asking you this is because, frankly, I don't want to miss anything. This is a this is such a treat to talk to a, a figure painter of your caliber. And so if there's something, well, yeah, that I let's haven't see, you know, about. you know, what we could look at if you go up to the top of the web page here. OK, there's um, you should, when we get to the very the menu at the top, oh, it's, maybe it's already there. There should be a thing that says projects, I think. Okay. Human. Yeah. Comedia. Human yeah. Let's try presentation. Mm -hmm. Holy So crap. if you look at this, yeah, this is the four. And I think somewhere in here, if you scroll down, it might have some of the sketches. Or maybe if you click on one, it'll have some of the sketches. And you can get a little glimpse into the uh, 
Uh, maybe enlarge. Is that yeah, it? I'll try that. I suppose how often I'm looking at my own website. I know. We're all that way. This is insane. Maybe if we keep scrolling down. Oh, maybe, ah, there you goodness. go. You can see some things in there. So these are, are these the ones from imagination or the ones from reference? No, no. You can see stuff from imagination down here. And then you can see the drawing to the right at the bottom where I used my sketches that I had made. Mm -hmm. And I made a final draw. Okay. I've been doing Jeff's online mentorship program for about a year now. And it is awesome. Everything is online, super streamlined. If you can be there, I mean, you have the ability to talk to him once a week and he can review your work and help you. If you can't be there, it's pre-recorded. You can go back and even re-watch things if you miss something during class or couldn't be there. So the online portion of it is almost better than real life because you can always go back to it, which is awesome. The demos are recorded. It's just like all available whenever you need it. And I'm a stay-at-home mom of four and my time is limited and it's also very interrupted. And so to be able to go back has been clutch for me. And you get to work with Jeff Hine, who's awesome. He's tough. The assignments are simple, but difficult and they're difficult to make us all better. And he's able to give us these assignments coach us through it, help us stay excited to progress. And so it's just been a great experience. I am so grateful that he has been willing to take time away from his own art to offer all of us to have it. So if you're thinking about doing it, it's amazing. To learn more about how you could have me as a personal mentor, check out the link to heinatelier.com in the show notes or video description. So there's, there's just moments of the thought process showing up here. My goodness. Do you ever put anything together in Photoshop or anything, or is it all For Lately, I've been trying to do drawings. Not always. You know, it, a lot of it has to do with how much time mm -hmm. you have. Because the Photoshop thing, I did it in the past, and it's a, it is a much faster technique to get you where you want to go rapidly. Mm-hmm. But I've been trying to stick to drawing as much as possible now. I like the discipline of it. I find it just makes me a happier painter when I'm spending a lot of my time drawing. Mm -hmm. And particularly if I can actually work from life and get the model in there to develop my, uh, my conception. It's just such a nice way to go. And I find it makes me a better painter too. Yeah. So I'm trying to do that. That said, sometimes you don't have the time you know, to develop drawing after drawing after drawing, but it's an ideal. And on these ones, I did do it that way. These ones were just done completely because these are a commission. So I knew, you know, when you know you're getting paid for something, you can spend all the time in the world on it. I love your serpentine line quality. All these search lines that you just leave, it, it adds so much interest to your drawings. And uh, thanks. And this was the thing I was doing then, you know, was I was really trying to find those interesting lines. And I was a lot less concerned about the light and the shadow, particularly in the drawings, than I was about just trying to find those interesting rhythms and forms. Hmm. And you seem to have a really good understanding of anatomy. Am I am I wrong about that? Yeah, I did a lot of anatomy, you know, like I was saying, when I started off wanting to do the thing about that was learning perspective and anatomy were the two things that okay. you really could, could go forward very far without, especially if you were drawing, you know, superheroes and capes and underwear, you had to get all those muscles exactly right in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're, you're pretty much, I mean, I would say 95% of the time you're doing nudes. You don't do a lot of clothing. Not lately. You know, I, I, I sort of gave up on clothing a few years ago and I think I'm going to bring it back. <laughs> I think Are you? in the future coming up soon, I'm having this impulse that I want to start painting some clothes figures again, just because I feel like, you know, once you go four years with nudes and nudes and nudes and nudes, you go, okay, the brain wants to explore some new territory. Yeah. Now. Yeah. You can get bored of anything if you do it long enough. 
Yeah, you know, and also I think one thing I I haven't done clothing in a while, and I've drawn so much since the last time I was working with clothes that now I want to see if I can go into the clothes and find those kind of rhythms and patterns and things that I've been trying to find in the figures. Well, it's not like your paintings are void of fabric and drapery. I mean, they have, it's in there. So, I, I mean, it's, yeah, you obviously can do it, but I get what you it mean. It makes an appearance. Yeah, I get, I get yeah. what you mean. Well, I've been thinking a lot about the thing that Da Vinci would do where he would make a clay model, drape it in cloth with wet clay on it, and kind of make this beautiful sculpture of drapery and then work from that. And so this has been sort of coming back to me as a thing recently. It would be fun to really design some beautiful drapery. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did Michelangelo do? He would he would actually sculpt the drapery? Yeah, what a lot of them would do is they'd make a model. And it could be maybe a figure, a lay figure with hay in it or something. Or it could be an actual a sculpture. And they would then take cloth and dip it in wet clay and then drape it over in these patterns. So it had a kind of a clinging heaviness to it, but that clay would dry. Or you could do it with glue, I think, as well. And that can dry, and then you can sculpt all kinds of crazy things out of it. It dries. But I think they would do it at a smaller scale. And so by wetting the clay, right, it would make it fold a bit tighter. No so it created joke. this interesting look. Yeah, and I read a book um, about Rubens, it was called something Rubens and the True Method. And they were talking about when he went to Venice and he met the students of Tintoretto and they were making these models, right? That was Tintoretto's thing is making these little models and lighting them almost like a diorama mm -hmm. and then painting them. And that there was this idea that you could make little models and drape them and then get your heads and hands and body parts from life. But you can make these whole scenes of little clay figures and with the drape. Yeah, and that's what I do. That. That's how I make my paintings. Oh, but yeah. but what's fascinating to me is the clay part, the drapery part. So I was literally, yeah. let me tell you something. So I this painting that I just told you about that I'm doing, I was literally using tweezers to m modify the wrinkles on these tiny costumes what? I made for these, you know, 12 inch tall figures. And but but I mean, that never occurred to me to wet them in, I, I'm assuming it's a water-based clay solution. Like a really- You could do either, what, uh, you could use water-based clay. I think you could use a kind of a glue as well. There's glue mediums that people use to sculpt fabric for craft projects. Yeah, and then it freezes it. And then you're, then you can, yeah. you can literally force it into shape instead of hoping that gravity doesn't overtake it. Yeah, because it's a small fold, right? Gravity operates differently at that scale. Right. And so if you get it wet, now suddenly gravity is working in a Oh my god. And something that you would recognize as a larger figure, right? This is gold. I am definitely going to be trying that one. I have never It's a cool trick. I learned this from a sculptor. And I'm like, "Wow, you can do that." They made these little figures and they just dipped I think it was called slip. They dipped the cloth in wet clay. Yeah. And it immediately became this very Grecian looking sort of drapey, clingy cloth. Incredible. And then hard. That's brilliant. It's so beautiful. It's amazing. Well, you know, we, we look back at earlier generations. I mean, I, I mean, we, maybe, maybe other people don't do it, but I feel like a lot of contemporary modern people think that we're so much more intellectually advanced today. And yeah, yeah, there we are do. a few of us that can build a cell phone. Mm -hmm. But the rest of us, <laughs> it's like the things they were coming up with in an artist studio back then, it, it, oh, yeah. they were I mean, genius. It, I mean, that's that seems obvious when you know about it, but who came up with that? I mean, it's brilliant. I'm assuming it must go way back. You know, it must be one of those traditions that just goes back forever yeah. and ever. Because you see that kind of cloth on Greek statues, even this sort of beautiful, clinging, wet looking cloth, you know? Yeah. And they had a whole sort of industry around it. When you think they were building these churches and these palaces, and people were in there carving wood ceilings and doing frescoes and putting sculptures everywhere, you just had this whole system that everything in life 
was crafted. So imagine how that is. You know, you want to make a little scene. Well, you live in a town with countless woodworkers who are doing beautiful, beautiful carving. They were the architects are hiring them to make small scale models of their buildings. And if you were a painter getting a big commission, you could go to these same guys and have them make you these little buildings. Hmm. And uh, get a candle and light the thing. And there were sculptures. I remember reading about one offhand. I don't remember. Maybe it was Correggio. Probably not, though. Maybe it was Andrea del Sarto. I don't know. But there's one of these artists who hired a sculptor that might have been San Silvano to make cherubs. So they put these little cherubs, and you could see them from below, lit just right. And you think about well, it without photography. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same, the same thing. thing. People are doing modeling now which is basically a high tech version of the same thing. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I haven't, I've got people telling me that I need to stop building these maquettes and go to 3d modeling, but I, there's just, and I think you could probably relate to this. There's something about making art with your hands and instead of on a keyboard that just appeals to me. And even though that's technically not the finished product, even just building the little house, or sewing yeah. the costumes to me that's part of the art even if it's not what gets hung on the wall and this yeah it is magic i love that tactile and there's also quality and real light too right you're probably able to see those things under actual light right and not the digital algorithm of a camera right that's already telling you how to interpret what you see which i think is really valuable Mm -hmm. as well such a difference mm -hmm. and it's kind of cool too because not only is it like is it an actual thing that you're sculpting with your hands but i think there's no better tool than the fingers like from my experience and i've done some of the 3d modeling for projects i think it's actually harder 3d modeling i think no kidding yeah it's more difficult in some ways I it's very counterintuitive that. it would be counterintuitive because it's not actually 3d it's not actually 3D. It's all based on symbols and clicks of a mouse and keypad stuff where you obviously, you know, you have the skills. It's you just get some clay and you make something. There's it's probably much more natural. So I think. And the work you're doing is amazing with the real thing. I don't think you need any 3D modeling at all. Oh, thank you. Well, it's more fun anyway. I love playing with my dolls, so. <laughs> dressing my dolls anyway. yeah it's got to be a nice break <laughs> it is it's a nice break from painting so you said you paint a lot I, i'm curious about how you manage your days and because most of us who are painters obviously there's some of us who have podcasts who that you know gets into their schedule but how do you manage your days because even even a painter that doesn't have a podcast uh, you've got to pay bills. You've got to answer phone calls. You've got to answer emails. So how do you manage your time and how much time are you able to paint in a week? You know, I try to do a lot at the moment. It's not as much as I would like simply because this year has been one long push for the last, let's say 12, 14 months. And so I'm starting to run a little low on energy and tune in to dinner and an aperitivo and the, porch uh maybe a little earlier than i should at times mm -hmm. but typically i just get up i'm trying to exercise lately, and then go right to the studio start working and work until i can't work anymore basically um that's pretty much it i don't spend much time on my business i probably should i should probably be smarter about that but this year i'm particularly overcommitted. i sometimes say yes to things <laughs> a slightly insane way mm -hmm. and then i have to just make it work you know so i would say i don't balance my time very well um i commit up heavily and then work until i can barely stand and then eat dinner yeah and call it a night do you have a family no 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 i have uh my girlfriend i live with here Okay. And well, in a way, you have a family. Then you do have a, a you have a partner. That's yeah. more or less family, yeah. And she's a painter. Oh, she and, is. I mean, I have back in the United States, but yeah, she's a painter as well. 
And so, you know, we have, we're both very driven. Mm. So our days tend to be a bit wake up, push, hopefully find time to go out and maybe in the afternoon have a glass of wine and a snack or something and go right back, back to work, make dinner in the evening. So that's, you know, there's, I want to do a podcast at some point and maybe I'll invite you and her in to the podcast, but a podcast couples, because, um, I'm so curious about that. I mean, I'm, I'm not married to an artist and, uh, okay. I am married. I'm not married to an artist and, uh, I find it fascinating the lifestyles of artists who are married to one another and i find it i find it very interesting but simply the fact that you're both working your tails off painting day in and day out so you expect that of the other person and uh so you accommodate their insanity you you basically you're accommodating her insanity and she's in accommodating your insanity i i would imagine That's that would be pretty convenient <laughs> It has its strong sides, right? I've actually never been in a somebody that wasn't an artist. And so I don't know from your situation, I imagine it might be a nice break sometimes. Maybe there's ups and downs to the different kinds of situations. Yeah, I don't know. I've never been married to an artist. So yeah, okay. it's I'm sure I'm sure there are pros and cons. Um, I've often wondered if it's competitive, you know, if that's difficult. If one, one, it can, it can be. Okay. <laughs> I've always taken the opposite though. I'm really happy to have the person I'm with go out and make a fortune so I can relax a little bit. <laughs> so I'm kind of, you're like, go be the sugar mama. <laughs> yeah, do it. Do it. Get big, get huge. <laughs> I'll just, I love I'll it. The pool. I love it. Hey, it's good. No that's, ego. No, I mean, I think it's great because as that's the one thing of two artists, you do think sometimes, Maybe one of us should have been a lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. but the great thing is, I think as a couple, you really want the other person to be successful. Yeah. If uh, for so many reasons, right? there's obviously a lot of reasons, one of which is selfish, let's say that you, you like to have the person you're with be successful. It makes your life easier. It makes them happier. Mm -hmm. It opens mm -hmm. doors as a team. You can kind of push together um i think there's a lot of good reasons that you want to support each other you know it's, it seems like it would, it would be such a waste to just be competitive with each other yeah well it's a little different with children but i've got a couple children who are artistic and one is studying with me now and someone asked me recently oh man what are you going to do if she gets better than you and i was like <laughs> what kind of question is that i'll be i'll be her biggest fan like i hope she is yeah. better than me <laughs> but i don't know maybe, maybe good i hope she is but that's a daughter i mean i don't again i don't it's i don't know if it's different or not but i imagine if you really care about someone you just want them to succeed of course and you think you have a legacy there too you know yeah i yeah. mean what an amazing thing to have your child go on to be this great artist yeah. And you probably, as you get older, you want a successful child to, you know, help out too. So yeah. that's again, that classic thing. You, know, you think of these old families coming from Europe in the 19th century, like everybody, J.C. Landecker, where his mission was to go out and make a success of himself because the family required it. Hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, as you know, as an American, that's not really the American culture these days, but... No. But uh, but having students from other cultures, you start to see like yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a bit of pressure. They want their kid to be successful because they're counting on them for retirement. As they go, as they go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. No kidding. Well, that's yeah. Well, what is your wife's? Or sorry, your girlfriend's name? Azusena Merkel. Okay. You're going to have to send that to me. I want to look her up and see what kind of work she does, but I'll, send but I'll never be able to spell that myself. So if you could send that my way, that'd be great. I'd love to, I'd love to see your work. Um, okay. Well, yeah. I got one final question for you. And that is if you could give one piece of advice to an aspiring artist that you wish you had, what would that be? Hmm. The one piece of advice that I wish I had, I guess I would tell them, 
to trust themselves completely and their own taste, but go in without ego and learn everything you can from every opportunity that you have. I think, um, I think I did the opposite in some ways. I trusted myself, but my ego got in the way of me learning as much as I could have, particularly early on in life. So I would say, know what you want, know who you are, and then just go in and take everything you can from everybody. Hmm. That's good advice. Yeah, and it's funny you would say that because in the beginning of the conversation, I was thinking that I wouldn't have put it ego, but but it we all have egos, right? And if you're if if you're stubborn, as you put it earlier, as you described yourself anyway, that comes from ego, right? You're like, no, I'm yeah, doing it my way and no one's gonna tell me different. That served you well. It served you really well, that stubbornness. But then as you put and it- And in the long run, right? Yeah, but then as you put it, yeah. even, but even something that's a strength can also be a weakness. The key is to like find yes. that balance, right? Is you're stubborn enough to push forward and push hard, but not so stubborn that you don't listen to good or take good information when it's presented to you. Yeah, and to be humble enough to say, okay, this person may not be doing exactly what I what I want to do, but obviously they're very accomplished at what they do. And by going in and just learning that, that's going to push me so much further down the road. As long as you don't get lost, you know, and you set out wanting to paint like Rubens and you end up painting still lives or something, it means you probably got a little bit lost along the way. But I was the opposite. I was so stubborn that I go, I don't have any use for this. I'm just going to do my own thing. Hmm. And I think that makes, it just makes things take longer than they have to take, you know, because it's such a long journey to kind of learn the skills, find your own voice and your own vision and tie all of that together, it's, it, it's gonna, it could be, you know, 10, 15 years. Like I think of Rubens who did his real masterpiece when he was 33, I think. And up until then you look at his paintings and you go, okay, they're fine, mm -hmm. but they're not great. And then suddenly all that information of that long journey came together. And I think that's how it is for an artist when they're learning, right? They're taking, they're digesting, they're integrating a lot of things. And then one day that clicks mm -hmm. and they have something and it's, you just figure that's going to take a while and you have to learn whatever you can on the way. Yeah, that's so true. Well, man, I miss 33. I'm at 48 and I'm still waiting for my masterpiece. <laughs> one, one of these days, Me too. I'm 44, freaking 33. <laughs> yeah. You're ne With, it's, you, you, know. you never feel like you found it, but well, Thank you again for being on the podcast. You know, I can't imagine, I can't imagine ever being able to paint like you, but certainly don't have the same temperament. But nonetheless, I have. And your style's so different, right? Yeah, so my style's so different. But to your point, I've I've learned at least two or three things I'm going to apply to my own painting, and I, so I appreciate your generosity in um, in oh. sharing so freely. Because I've ser I, I think it's going to help me with my own work, and I imagine my guests will feel the same way. So, appreciate your generosity. Right. And coming yeah, thank on the you, show. Man. It's a, your work is brilliant. Thanks, man. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe, and if you could leave a comment or review, that really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends, and if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.